Uh, thank you all for, 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 for coming out uh, to what is our final Thursday afternoon talk in the Contemporary History Institute speaker series this semester. Um, my name is Ingo Trauschweitzer. I'm, I'm the director of CHI, and if you're new to our events, and I see a number of faces I don't recognize, I, I just want to point out that we're a multidisciplinary institute that, that tries to join the perspectives of history, economics, political science, journalism, and a few uh, related hangers on in an effort to make sense of the questions that define our time. And, and today that uh, touches on, on modern Japan uh, and on how the state has tried to shape environment and modernization alike. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Philip Brown, the most excellent professor we, I think we settled on, uh, of early modern and modern Japanese and environmental history at Ohio State University. Um, he earned his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania won't tell you when. Um, I will tell you he's been in Columbus uh, for going on 30 years, right? Yeah. Since 1990 and had uh, previously taught at the University of North Carolina. Um, Professor Brown also held distinguished visiting appointments in Japan uh, at Niigata University and at the National Institute of Japanese Literature in Tokyo. He's published widely uh, and won many grants, including, it's rather unusual for, for a historian both in, in sort of depth and, 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 uh, and weight, a three-year, $223,000 project from the National Science Foundation uh, on coping with disaster, civil engineering, floods, and landslides in the modernization of Japan. Uh, his books include Central Authority and Local Autonomy in the Formation of Early Modern Japan, which appeared in 1993, and Cultivating Commons, Joint Ownership of Arable Land in Early Modern Japan, which appeared in 2011. Um, Professor Brown will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes or so. We'll, we have some time for, uh, for questions and answers to follow. We're in the unusual position that we actually have to get out of the room a little bit before six, since the Alumni Association is apparently pressing in. Uh, so we'll have to possibly shave off a question or two at the end. Uh, but with that, I hope you will join me in welcoming Philip Brown to Ohio University and to the Contemporary History Institute. Thank you very much, Professor Trosswell. Um I have done actually most of my work in uh, what people think of as the early modern period, uh, which goes up to approximately 1868. Um, I, I didn't start off to be an early modern specialist. I started off to, to be a modern social historian. And the problems that I wanted to research led me back another 300 years in the course of writing my dissertation. And now I've come home and I'm doing more work that's in, in, in the modern era. Um, the, the dam that I want to talk about is an interesting case for me for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, first, uh, we are dealing with a, an example of a global phenomenon. Uh, Post-World War II has seen a spree of building large dams. Uh, a lot of them use the Tennessee Valley Authority and its regional planning and design of multiple dams as uh, an inspiration for this. And Japan is certainly one of those, one of those cases. But it's not, this is not something that's limited to Japan by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's a useful example in thinking about the relationship between central author political authority, local authorities, and local, local uh, groups, local, local populations, uh, and the ability or inability of local populations to have their voices heard. And for James Scott, a political scientist, he thinks about the, the state as creating from especially the late 18th and 19th century a kind of map of the state that, that simplifies things. It, it, it looks in terms of averages, uh, it, it, instead of uh, variations and, and individual populations. Uh, it becomes, in that sense, more legible in his words. Um, he thinks about the role of particularly ambitious people, people especially in third world countries, uh, that think of symbols of modernization and the need to, to display those and to show evidence of being modern. Um, he calls it a faith in modernization. 
And then he also talks about the inability of civil society to resist the state, to offer any kind of obstruction or, or, or successful opposition. In addition to that broader kind of, of a theoretical issue, which uh, he claims leads to higher costs for local populations and, and mistakes of often tragic proportions, um, we can also talk about this as, as uh, an example that gives us some changing, uh, I think, different perspectives at least, on post-war Japanese history. Um, we think that Japan, after MacArthur's arrival, became democratic, became capitalist, it, it went a, underwent a, a very rapid and quick transformation. Well, this particular example causes me to question how much of a transformation there actually was. Um, is Japanese society, civil society weak? That's another question. Certainly in the case of this dam, we'll find that local opposition had its limitations. Um, but does this mean this is a, this is a weak civil society? Um, it also illustrates in the case of relationships between local administrative units and the central administrative apparatus, the power of the purse. Um, and that really is, is, is a, a critical issue. But there are other issues of what kinds of attitudes do bureaucrats have of the public? What kinds of expectations do provincial governors have of Tokyo? or Tokyo of them, and what, what, their, what their balance of, of input and decision making is. For some context, um, Japanese river management is a global scale kind of operation. Um, the top five producers of large dams, that is to say dams 15 meters high or more, or between five and 15 meters, and uh, having an impounded reservoir of 15 square meters of, of, of water. Um, Japan ranks number six. China's number one. U.S. is number two, but surprisingly it's far behind China. India is number, is, is number three. Um, Japan is four. And the only European nation is Spain. And despite the fame of its hydroelectric power programs, the Soviet Union's not there at all. Um, in fact, somewhat surprisingly, when you first look at this, of the top 10, assuming we count Turkey as part of Asia, half of these nations are located in Asia. Uh, and, and Japan is certainly among the more robust of those. In a global context, this kind of effort has meant the, re the relocation uh, of some 80 million people over the course of the past century. That's a, a huge migration, a huge forced migration. In broader historical context in Japan, if you look at the, the trends in, in building large dams, we've got some that go back even into ancient times. But Overwhelmingly, it's the post-war period that's producing these, these large dams. Uh, whether you're talking about those that are 30 meters high or whether you're talking about those that are, that are, are sh less than 30 meters but having a large reservoir. Um, why so many large dams in Japan? Well, there, there are a lot of issues here. One of them is certainly geographic. Japan is a, is a very, very mountainous area. The distance between here and here is less than the distance from the northern border of Ohio to the southern border, or from the eastern border to the western border. That's about 220 miles. In Japan, we're talking about a distance, as the crow flies, of less than 200 miles. So between that and the fact that you go from sea level to 3,000 meters just to get to Mount Fuji over a, a much shorter distance gives you a sense of how steep the mountain slopes are in Japan. And although the mountains are lower in the southern part of Japan, it's still the same issue. Mm -hmm. um, we get a sense that, that Japan has a plain, 
the, the Kanto plane is the key example. This is as much a plane as San Francisco is, which is to say it's not very flat. It's not central Ohio or north, northwestern Ohio. It's not Illinois. It is, it is really quite rugged, and that creates challenges in terms of flooding and in terms of landslides. Between 1950 and 2003, in one prefecture alone, Niigata Prefecture, there were over 4,000 landslides. Now, landslides are caused by lots of different things, including human activity and earthquakes, but that's still a large number of, of uh, landslides. The end result is a very, very steep gradient to most Japanese streams, and Japanese streams tend to be really short. Um, the Joganji River is in the Toyama Prefecture area. It's really very short, but it drops like a waterfall. The Tone River is the large river that runs today north of Tokyo. Um, again, it's longer, but it's still a precipitous drop. The Shinano River, the Yoshino River, the Kiso River, they're, they're all fairly typical of what you see in, in Japan. The scale may be different. The scale may be relatively small, but the, the outcome is still the same. You're getting a lot of rain, and Japan is a wet country, um, in a very short period of time, and you can get massive flooding very quickly. On the Shinano River, people in Tokamachi, which is about halfway up the, 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 the river to the Nagano border, know that if it's raining in Nagano, where the Winter Olympics were some, some years ago, that eight hours later, they're at risk of flood in Tokamachi. Um, it, this is all very predictable. Um, Japan's rivers are small. They have small drainage basins. Even, even the Tone River, which is one of the largest rivers in Japan, uh, is, is much smaller than the Rhine drainage basin. Reservoirs for dams tend to be really small. The entire impoundment of water in Japan is less than one dam in the United States. So people are building projects that are relatively small in very rugged territory that are very expensive to build, and yet Japan is still producing a large number of these, these dams. Um, Flood control in Japan requires a lot of smaller projects that are very expensive. And a lot of what goes on in the post-war period is linked to the fact that Japan, at the end of the war, frees up a major part of its budget. In the pre-war period, that budget is heavily focused on military expenditures. In the post-war period, despite the displeasure of some recent presidents that Japan won't arm, rearm itself. Um, because of American policy, Japan doesn't have a large army, at least by international standards. Put that in perspective. Japan's current self-defense forces, not army, not navy, not air force, self-defense forces, only for defense purposes, has a budget as big as the British military budget. So when we say small, it's small as a percentage of GNP, but it's not small in global scale. So the freeing up of funding to spend on dams to build these expensive projects uh, is, is one outcome of World War II. Another war-related issue is that building dams makes a great contribution to rebuilding the economy, the post-war economy, and giving people jobs. Dams are part of an, uh, an economic stimulus package that, that generates a certain amount of local jobs. It certainly generates jobs for people who are coming from uh, construction companies that have their, the basic of, core of their, ref, uh, their labor resources coming from outside of, of, of a, a particular province. But in any event, it, it employs lots of people. It increases demand for products that also will grow industries that employ lots of people. Cement. In order to build a dam, you have to build railways in order to get material up to the dam. 
up to the construction site. Um, and that means people are going to make money with production of iron, steel, and so forth. Hydroelectric power that dams can generate was a major contributor to Japan moving from fossil fuel powered trains to electric trains, um, all of which provided employment opportunities and opportunities for economic growth. Um, in the pre-war period, electric power companies would have been among the major builders of, of dams. In the post-war period, most of the easy pickings were gone. And so sh funding shifts from the private sector to the public sector. It's the central government that can marshal the resources, the financial resources to build these dams, and in many ways the technical resources to plan them. Uh, again, TVA is a big model here. When the Tone River Regional Riparian Management Program was developed, newspapers literally said it rivaled the, the Panama Canal in its size, its, skill, its scope, and its impact. Uh, we may not think that that's an accurate view, but it, it gives you a sense of how important people in Japan felt about this. There are also different technological uh, issues. In, in the pre-war period, technologies were relatively restricted. In the post-war period, we get the development of new materials, like wider use in Japan of reinforced concrete. Concrete was not used for building bridges. Concrete was used for very limited purposes. It wasn't, lim it wasn't widely available for, for, for dam construction. Its total volume of production was relatively low. In the post-war period, that changes. There's new kinds of power equipment. Um, and all told, you have an ability to work in more difficult and more remote places than was possible in the pre-war period. The most immediate stimulus to dam building was a series of disastrous hurricanes in the immediate post-war period. Um, Hurricane Kathleen is the one that stands out in, in most people's minds in 1947. Um, in a matter of a, of, of a couple of weeks, uh, 1,800 people died or, or, or were missing. Um, that's much worse than what we experienced about two or three weeks ago. Um, in a sense, this is, to use Dennis Miletti's expression, disaster by design. That is to say, hills were denuded. Watershed was destroyed because of the scarcities of war. People used the wood for fuel, not only for, for cooking or for heating, but also there were projects to convert wood products to fuel, to power vehicles and ships and airplanes. All of that deforestation created very, very vulnerable watersheds. Plans began to try to address this issue uh, immediately after the war. And one of the things that differentiated this planning was not just that this was being encouraged for the by the SCAP, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces Pacific, to uh, uh, do more for the general population, uh, but uh, it, is, it, was, it was also uh, something that previously had been based on local need. And in this case, in, in post-war period, it's much more top-down planning. It's much more dependent on seeing like a state. Uh, in the pre-war period, although a relatively restricted amount of money was spent on building dams for, for flood prevention and so forth, um, at least the plans that were funded had been requested by people from local areas. They competed for priority within their prefectures and then among the 40-odd the, the prefecture, prefectures of Japan after that. So people wanted these projects. People saw value in these projects. That's not necessarily true in the post-war period. And Yamba Dam, I think, nicely illustrates that. Um, the Tone River Flood Control Alliance was formed soon after uh, Kathleen. The central government and representatives from six prefectures were co collaborating in this particular project, so at least there was an effort made to incorporate local perspectives. But talks stayed at a pretty high level throughout this entire process. 
1949, that process resulted in a comprehensive plan for the repair and improvement of the Tone River. And this includes a really broad area. It includes all of the Kanto area, and it includes areas up into the mountains in Guma Prefecture and other, and, and other places that are really quite remote, but all tied by systems of rivers to protection of the, the, the Tokyo area, basically. Uh, and Yamba is one of those. Um, the prefecture is marked in the top map. The geography of the, the prefecture itself uh, with the location of Naganoharamachi, Naganohara town, is marked in the red arrow there. And it's, it's a, a simple 131 meter high dam. It's a concrete gravity dam. There's nothing special about it. It's not unusual in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's designed, like many large dams, as a multi-purpose dam. That is to say, it's designed to promote tourism, supply water to urban areas for, for human consumption and industrial use, uh, to generate hydroelectric power, and to control floods. I can't remember where I, where I, I came across it, but, but multi-purpose dams, from an engineering standpoint, aren't necessarily the best kind of dams to build. As one engineer said, a multi-purpose dam is no, is, is no, is no good for any damn purpose. <laughs> um, but in order to justify big expenditures of public funding, People want to advertise this as broadly beneficial to as wide a base of people as possible. And this is not unique to Japan. It's, this, is, this is globally. Um, and so this is designed and justified as a multi-purpose dam. It is, it is not a high priority dam. Dams farther downstream are developed first, and the construction of those dams is completed. As we'll see, the construction of this dam is still in process. Okay, this is since 19, early 1950s, late 1940s. Um, and one of the things that stands out uh, in, in my mind is the fact that when the building of this dam was first announced to mayor of Nagano Haramachi, um, it's 1952. Prior to this point, not a single official from the prefect uh, prefectural government or from the central government seems to have come on site. Nobody had talked to anybody locally about this. Not the prefectural government, not the national government, nobody. So there was shock when this notification first came in. Uh, people in the, wrote in the, in the town report, uh, why should we have to sacrifice our residences for people in the lower Tone River. It's a, a good two hour train ride even today from Tokyo. Um, it was clear people there felt that they weren't consulted. It's clear that they had no direct benefit or direct interest in this. The dam was designed for the purposes of people who lived elsewhere and industries that were based elsewhere. The August town meeting, a town council meeting, resulted in a, the development of a petition against the dam. Um, officials and residents formed a committee for countermeasures. Um, they created the first of a number of petitions to the Ministry of Construction. Um, when you look at this initial petition, it may not be easy to read the contents or to understand the contents. My wife, who's, who's Japanese, read this three or four times before she finally understood the degree to which people were angry and being, uh, being sarcastic in what they were saying. They said, we had, at the end of the war, had looked forward to the benefits of peace and the possibility of economic recovery and growth and modernization. Never did we imagine that the benefits of modernization would be visited upon us so soon. Um, 
there are a variety of consequences that to us seem perfectly obvious when, when we relate them, but that were ignored or not noticed or not paid attention to as the development of this project proceeds from this point forward. Now, at the same time that this is being announced, there's a, a parliamentary election that's being held. And this illustrates or begins to illustrate one of the, the problems in getting local voices heard. Two people are running for election in the third district, among others. Um, and they're, they're getting two people running, not against each other exactly, but electoral districts in Japan are multi-member districts. You have three people representing one district or two people representing one district, not just one person representing one district. And in addition, like the British Parliament, you don't have to live there. Well, this particular district happens to be known as the Kingmaker District of Japan because at least three prime ministers have come out of this district and two of them are running in the 1952 election. Fukuda Takeo and Nakasone Yasuhiro, uh, Ronald Reagan's great friend. Um, Fukuda was a supporter of the dam. Nakasone seemed to take a softer position. He was arguing that people should continue to discuss this. He was, was apparently sympathetic to the opposition in the, to the construction of this, this particular dam. And we'll come back to these folks in a while. Um, petitions tried to make the point to the Ministry of Construction that there were some real problems with building a dam in this particular area. The Agatsuma River, the river that was going to be dammed, was often referred to locally as a dead river. And nobody above the town level or the local area level seemed to be aware of this. There are no fish in this river. The water was not drinkable. The water was not useful for irrigation. The river was effectively dead. Why? Because of naturally occurring chemicals that come as a result of volcanic activity in the area. It's, there are, are volcanoes that scientifically or technically would be defined as still active in this, in this region. There are lots of hot springs as a result of, of the underwater heat and uh, underground heat and so forth. Um, so what happens? Nails in 10 days, if they're in this water, go from this to that. Locks of cement go from this to that in 30 days. Great place to build a dam, <laughs> right? And why is it that people didn't seem to know anything about this? They didn't have any contact with, 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 with local people. Well, that seemed to be a, a game stopper, at least to people who were op opposed to the dam. Um, Guma Prefecture, uh, however, took initiative and created probably with cooperation from the Ministry of Construction, because I don't think they had the technical personnel who, could, who were capable of making these analyses or thinking about this. Um, and they developed a project for their overall development of the Agatsuma River. Now, this is local, at least it's prefectural level. One would think it would be alert to local issues, but as we'll see, that's not the case. Um, the prefecture decided that it had a solution to uh, a number of, of, of the problems that were posed here, but it was going to take the initiative, it was going to fund things. Uh, in the United States, that would depend on state taxes. In Japan, prefectural budgets, even today, are one-third to two-thirds um, made up of funds transferred from the central government. In other words, they're heavily dependent on the central government. If the central government says we are willing to give money to fund two-thirds of the cost of this project, if the prefecture will fund one-third of it, the chances are pretty good that the carrot is going to be grabbed. And that's a, a link that makes prefectural decisions in many ways dependent on the desires of the central government. Um, this particular issue 
continues to be a problem despite efforts to try to decentralize control in Japan over the past three decades. Um, the, pre the prefecture in this case uh, proposed a solution to, to the acidity of the water. Build a neutralizing plant, add lime to the water, neutralize the acidity, and as an experiment, they set up a plant and introduced limestone mixtures into the Yu River, one of the tributaries of, of the uh, Agatsuma, uh, uh, located in, in uh, a further upland region, uh, for, for further inland area, in a town called Kusatsu. This is what that plant looks like these days. Um, they take lime from a mountain, they bring it down here, they, they make it into a slurry, and then they just dump the slurry into the river. Well, this, this experiment worked. But in order to make this really effective, you have to build a dam and find some way to collect water while it's being neutralized or after it's been neutralized so that you can control the, the acidity of the water that goes ultimately into the Agatsuma River. And in this particular case, the central government funded a dam. It's the Shinaki Dam. And this is an area that's basically unpopulated. We, there was nobody living in this area. There are no hamlets in the area that were going to be, be um, removed by the creation of a reservoir. And this, this works. Um, it's, it's a little dam. It's a pretty area. Um, but the biggest concern in the long run is what happens when the area in the pond, the reservoir, fills with sediment. And remember, people are adding limestone to this. They're creating a precipitate. And so you haul it out. What do you do with this stuff as you, that you're dredging out? Well, you find a place to dump it. NIMBY starts to play a role, not in my backyard. So, no, so the place where this stuff is dumped is kept secret. Except, at one point, a member of the local town becomes disgruntled and he reveals the location of one of these places. And you can, you can see that here. It's all covered over. Um, I'm not sure there's anything particularly obnoxious about this, but people in Japan are very sensitive to the possibilities of pollution. Um, there's a third site, and the first site, which location of which nobody knows at, at, at this point, but, but this, this process is still going on. And in lots of ways, this was beneficial. The Dead River comes alive. And again, that's what the, the newspaper headline said. It's an area where water now could host trout. You could use the water for irrigation. It was potable. Um, you, could, you could use the river for leisure purposes. And maybe those outcomes were sufficient in and of themselves so that the people who were opposing the dam thought that this was still off the boards. Unfortunately, it's not the case at all. This is just the groundwork for building Yamba Dam. The dam is clearly revived by March of 1965 when Major Sakurai Takashi, uh, Takeshi is, is notified that the dam will be built. Now this raises another example of problems with state seeing because now the exact location of the dam was, was identified, the spread of the reservoir was made clear, and that created a number of problems. Key tourist sites in the area were going to be threatened, and that threatened the economy of this area. This area in Naganohara is a, a place people come to see the scenery. It's a place where they come to bathe in the hot springs. Its lifeblood is tourism. And this was going to threaten that. Uh, this is clear when you look at the town council petition of opposition. Um, the source of all of the hot springs was going to be covered over by the reservoir. So no hot springs. Two nationally designated famous places were going to be lost. So you have the government on the one hand saying these places need to be preserved, and on the other hand the Ministry of Construction, Construction saying no, we're going to sink them. Um, depopulation, people predicted, was sure to follow. And in fact, that's happened, although that's going on everywhere in Japan. Depopulation of rural areas is severe. 
Um, but Nagano-Haramachi has experienced particularly difficult circumstances. And nobody tr trusted the Ministry of Construction anymore. Not very surprising, I guess. Um, this is a picture of the, the, um, the Koto Bridge and the, the ravine. Um, these are, by American standards, small, compact areas, but from a Japanese perspective, they're very attractive. And I, I think you can see why. Uh, by 1973, the protesters seemed to have uh, uh, achieved some kind of, of victory. Their voices finally seemed to be heard, at least to some degree. Um, the Ministry of Construction relented and said, okay, we'll move the dam 600 meters upstream. That certainly protected a number of things, but it wasn't in itself a complete solution. Um, meanwhile, on the ground in Nagano Haramachi, people are beginning to think in terms of compromise. Uh, uh, Mayor Sakurai uh, Takeshi in 1954 is actually pro dam. Now his city, his, his town council is not. So this doesn't change the, the direction of local, local sentiment uh, from the, the administrative standpoint all that much. But by 1965, there is a group of people who are willing to cooperate with the central government under certain conditions. And their key demands focus on things that you would, I think, pretty much expect. The costs of their relocation or any disturbances to, to, to the, the residents had to be borne by the central government. And they had to accommodate local needs, not just make decisions from the top down when they thought about compensation relocation, uh, aux building of auxiliary services to the community as a, as a, a further compensation for this. Um, by 1973, these people, along with the prefectural government, uh, governor, uh, supported legislation in the National Assembly to address these issues not only for Yamba Dam, but this was a national concern. The construction of Narita Airport is the, probably the most well-known or outstanding example of, of public protest against public works projects. Um, in 1978, as I was flying out of, Yamba, uh, out, of, out of Narita, people were still burning tires to try to create smoke to interrupt and dis disrupt the, the flights. Uh, if you fly into to Narita today, if you look carefully, you will see a rice paddy in the middle of the airport. The one lone holdout who would not sell his land. Um, and this, is, this not only resulted in national legislation, it's also resulted in a reticence on the part of now the, the Kanto prefectural governments or the city of Tokyo for going ahead with any project if there's any opposition at all. This has had long-term impacts. But the national legislature was responding to Narita, to projects on the uh, Yoshi River, to, to projects in many different parts of Japan. Now, the problem of divided representation, the problem of non-resident reputation, begins to be felt when Nakasone the one person who had offered any hope of an appeal to the national government urges protesters to be cautious and to be quiet. Why? Because he's now a member of the cabinet. He's got his own career to protect. And he doesn't live there, right? Um, and this is really the last hope that the opponents had of trying to oppose this dam successfully. By 1984, the mayor has reached an agreement with the prefecture to cooperate with the dam project, and they agree on comp compensatory measures, not just for the individuals, but for the community as a whole, in terms of, of, of relocating railways, uh, creating new, new public facilities of various sorts. Um, this was a package that a number of people felt they could compromise with. 
that wasn't true for the people who were going to lose their homes. Um, these people continued to protest and ultimately when they, over time, felt they'd run into a brick wall, they all simply agreed to take the government's money and to leave the area entirely. They didn't want to be relocated. They wanted just to be completely separated. And this in the, in the Japanese context is very unusual. People think of their families as having a strong identification with a particular place. If not particular fields, at least a particular village. In August, for All Souls Day, Obon, people go back to their hometowns. They go visit the rural places that many of them came from or at least where their grandparents came from. Um, so, so the decision to leave the town is really critical. It's, it's furthermore linked to graveyards, spirits of the ancestors. Uh, all of these, these kinds of considerations were going to be disturbed. Now ultimately a lot of these graveyards were relocated. The interred were taken out and put somewhere else. Um, and then that some measure that, that mollifies people. But basically from this time on, protest focus has shifted to problems of dam construction and what was going to be safe and whether the dams taking into consideration the possible impact of earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, landslides, and so forth. I'm going to skip ahead a number of years here, but Yamba Dam is still not started. The construction of it hasn't started, but it, by 2008, 2009, becomes a national poster boy for older, or for overbuilding of roads, dams, dikes, and other public works projects. It's particularly of concern to environmental groups. So we see this because of the sensitivity of some national figures. One is Kato Tokiko, who was involved with the student protests at Tokyo University in the 1960s, the anti-defense uh, uh, treaty uh, with the United States. Um, and, and she raises a lot of money to support one of the opposition groups in a benefit concert. But there are also people like professional engineers, Takeshi, um, Okuma Takashi, uh, for example, who begin to rethink the value of hard solutions to floods. And they begin to join the opposition and provide expertise for the op uh, opposition. Um, and by 2009, the Democratic Party of Japan lists as part of its program in the 2009 elections opposition to excessive useless civil engineering. It becomes part of their, their formal platform. They pledge to, to decommission or stop funding for over 800 different dam projects. The Democratic Party wins. So good guys have won, right? No. No. Um, when the Minister of Land Infrastructure and Trans Transport, Maya Hara Seiji, announces an end to the Yamba Dam and many other dams, and he goes to Yamba Dam, the Yamba Dam site and, and makes this announcement, the reaction of the public is negative. There's a radical policy, sh policy shift going on here, and again, Nobody in the Democratic Party has consulted anybody in the town. Nobody has consulted anybody in any of the locations where these projects are going on. Um, there were no plans announced to assist residents who had begun to accommodate to the fact that they're going to have to move and they're going to have to make changes in where they locate their Hot Springs Hotel. And basically, everybody was ignored. And remember, the people who were really opposed had already left, the people who were going to be flooded. So you're left with a different population, a population with a different orientation, but the same problem of a lack of connection between the local area on the one hand and the central government on the other hand. So Tokyo is acting on its own. And part of the justification for the Democratic Party's platform 
stopping all of these projects is to save budgetary expenditures. It was acting, the party was thinking nationally, but not in relationship to the local populations. So although the Democratic Party is in power for five years, and although construction of the dam doesn't begin, the, the outrage uh, is somewhat mollified by the fact that corollary projects continue under construction. That includes schools, new schools, um, clearing land for new construction, building new houses. These are nice houses. I mean, they are really up to date. They're very good in that regard. But many of them, unlike this particular picture, have a real problem because they're built into a hillside. So you cut into the hillside to make a flat place and you extend out where there didn't used to be anything. Which means, according to geologists, that these are particularly vulnerable to landslide. And if you think back just a, just a few days of the pictures that came out of Japan with, with the landslides, you, you can imagine what would, would, would be going on here. So schools, housing, uh, and issues of creating flat surfaces all come together here to create something that's a solution. And people are kind of acclimated to that, but it's not necessarily a particularly, it's, it's certainly not a perfect solution, let's put it that way. Um, new bridges are built, a new railroad station is built, um, this is a bridge that's going to go across the, the reservoir once the reservoir fills. Everybody thinks it's part of the dam, but it has nothing to do with the dam directly. Um, all of this continues even though the Democratic Party has said, we're going to stop all this. Why? The Diet keeps funding projects that are already on the board. The Parliament keeps funding projects that are already on the board. Why do they fund those projects? Well. A lot of their contributors have relationships with the construction industry. Now, it's not an exact quid pro quo, to use a current phrase. Um, uh, it is, it, it's, it's a willingness to support the general budget for which these companies can bid, on which they can bid for a share of the contract. Um, and the Ministry of Construction continues in its ordinary fashion with its own plans, its plans that benefit the ministry itself. So bureaucratic persistence is playing a background role here that's very, very important, I think. So the, the Ministry of Construction even creates a museum about all of these controversies and everything else. And it's very, very honest, and it's very, very detailed. The pictures I showed you of decaying, uh, of, 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 of uh, eroding cement and, and uh, decaying needles come from this museum. Yes. This is, they're perfectly open about this and still basically premising their actions on a favorable impression of what will happen with this, with this particular dam. In 2012, after a disastrous five years for the Democratic Party, uh, remember, uh, 311 happens at this time, the, the tsunami and, and earthquake that destroys so much of, of northeastern Japan. Abe Shin, uh, uh, Shinzo is, is, is elected lib the prime minister. Uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, which is the dominant political party since the end of World War II, uh, takes control and so-called Abenomics begins to revive plans for completing all of these dams that the Democratic Party was supposed to eliminate. Dam construction was to be restarted. And in fact, in January of 2015, construction actually begins. Let's see if I can get this to work. rather muffled start to a very controversial kind of program. 
Um, the dam construction has continued. This is what it looked like a few months ago. Um, and during the time of the, the uh, tsunami, not the tsunami, the, the um, um, hurricane uh, a couple of weeks ago, this dam actually served a purpose. It's not complete by any means, but it was complete enough so that they had tested its ability to hold water. And during the course of, of the typhoon, uh, it actually did help prevent more water from going downstream. Did it make a difference in terms of flooding? That's hard to say. We've gone 63 years without a dam and not had any particular problems because this, this one dam was missing. Um, but people paid attention to it because the claim was that without this dam, the lower Tone River would flood. I'll leave, you, leave it to you to make a decision about whether or not this was, was actually effective. So there are a couple of things that I, that I think of as important here. One is certainly problems of seeing like a state. And I, and, and I think we have to include the provincial governments in this, this uh, assessment as well. Um, it also suggests there were real limitations to the American ability to democratize Japan. The electoral district system, the local prefectural elections and so forth, all of that would exi existed pre-war. Yes, Marxists could speak out. Yes, socialists could speak out. They were released from prison. But does that change the way the central government listens to local populations? You know, the, the traditional way of thinking about the relationship between authorities and the public is summarized in a, a four-character phrase in Japanese, kansong min pi, revere the bureaucrat, despise the people. <laughs> and there's an element of that still operating here. It's not as blatant, it's not as, as, as rude or straightforward, but it's still assuming that the bureaucrat knows best, that science, scientists or engineers in the Ministry of Construction know what's good for people of Japan, and that's the end of the discussion. Uh, elected governors. Well, in the pre-war period, governors were appointed by Tokyo. So they were always at, acting at Tokyo's behest. Did the, the government, governor of Guma Prefecture fall prey to the same kind of attitude that governors were really just the tools of the central government, despite the fact that they were elected? They were often from the same party, so maybe that's not too surprising. Um, the, issue of getting any kind of representation for local areas in the current parliamentary system is, to me, brought forward very clearly by this example. Um, the, the lack of responsiveness of Fukuda and Nakasone is particularly telling. And of course, prefectural governments and local governments as a whole are subject to what it is the national government wants to use transfer payments for. In every major city office, there is a representative of the national government watching to see how national funds are spent. So there's, there's a watchful eye kept on this. Um, and, and the power of the purse is critical. There's some other examples I can talk about in discussion if you, if you would like. Um, now, my initial reaction as I, as I worked with this, this kind of material was to, to think that this, in combination with other things, su suggested to me that there was, there was a kind of process of internal colonization going on. That Naganohara Machi resources and the resources of other communities were being used largely without regard for local impact but to support some other part of Japan that was deemed to be worthy. Um, the Kanto residents, the Kanto industrialists, the Kanto businesses. Uh, water is increasingly a scarce resource in these areas. Uh, this is replicated throughout Japan. This is not just a single outstanding example. There are many examples like this. But another way to look at this is that this is a problem that's endemic to modern riparian civil engineering issues. National governments now have the ability to act over broad areas with a degree of precision 
that was unimaginable in 1850. Where do you stop building projects to prevent flooding or to prevent, uh, to, to assure a supply of water? How far upstream do you go? What's effective? What's cost effective? These decisions are now removed in many ways from, from the hands of local people and even local businesses since private industry is not make, making these plans. It's not just power companies that, that are at issue here. Um, the, longer, the larger the area, the more problem you have reconciling the differences of different stakeholders. Nagano Haramachi in 1850 had nobody interested in it except the people who lived there. Now, in 1950, 1952, we have the national government interested in manipulating resources in Nagano Haramachi for the benefit of the people in another part of Japan. Um, it's a very, very radical transformation and, and complication of the system. Um, the technological development, the economic power of the states have expanded the range of possibility for regional planning. Um, this kind of coordination would have been unimaginable in the pre-war period. So it's possible for this better integrated state apparatus and to, put to, to put to use specialized expertise and control to manage a full drainage system. So I'm going to leave you with those two possibilities and open the things up for questions. Japanese uh, woman play in all of this uh, bickering and negotiation over those years? The people who participate in citizens groups uh, tend to be people who are retired or women who don't, who have gotten through childbearing age. Um, but that's, that's really about the extent of it. The people's ability to participate in, in, in civic groups is quite limited by work schedules and, and demands of, of the family. Yes? Could you elaborate on the role that American policymakers had in the late 40s or early 50s when they still had a lot of sort of lead uh, oversight responsibilities? Yeah. Uh, encourage these projects for specific reasons of defense or anything like they that? Didn't, they didn't encourage specific plans, but they did encourage the general direction. Um, SCAP was interested in the, in the first instance in, in trying to maintain public peace and to, to, to try to pr present policies that were going to be more beneficial to the general population. That became more of an issue in 1948 as the Cold War began to break out and people were concerned that unhappy people in, in Japan might lead to the same kind of uh, phenomenon that you were seeing in Greece or in Yugoslavia or other places where, where uh, radical left-wing movements might seek to take power. Um, and that encouraged more of this, this kind of in encouragement. Um, I've tried to emphasize the Japanese side of this um, because, because I think that's where the bulk of responsibility is, but SCAP was certainly encouraging people to, to, in government to think in these terms, to think about protecting people. Yes? I know in uh, the post-war period <coughs> in the United States, similar projects were engaged in uh, pretty yeah. extensively. Um, but after the 1960s and 70s, a revolt against like technocratic bureaucrats really changed the way that these projects were done in the U.S. So I was just wondering, um, my knowledge of Japanese history isn't, isn't too strong. Um, was there a similar revolt in Japan? Um, and if not, why do you think that... The <coughs> There has been, but it's been hard to marshal a truly national movement. Most of these movements tend to be fairly local. Um, in 2007, there was the uh, first effort to get a group of these, a large group of these, these organizations to cooperate in a, in a Take Back the Rivers conference that was, that was um, quite well attended, uh, including the governor of um, Shiga Prefecture, who happened to get her PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and she, was, she was very concerned about, about this. Um, but on the whole, it's been very difficult to get leverage in opposition. So for example, there was a, there was a uh, commission formed to reevaluate the 
value of Yamba Dam. And Okuma Take Takashi, who, whose picture you saw, was one of the members of the committee. The committee had 20 some odd members. At his first meeting, it was going to elect a chair. Five people showed up. Three supporters of the dam and two opponents. Guess who got elected chair, right? And after that, there were multiple meetings scheduled and canceled at the last minute while people were on the trains coming to the meeting. This happened repeatedly. So in the end, the committee did nothing. It, it, it issued a report that was basically favorable, but it, m many of the meetings were under attended if they were held at all. Um, this is not representative democracy in the way that we normally think about it. You know, it, it may not work in the United States because people refuse to pay attention and attend. That happens for sure. But the deliberate manipulation of this committee just astounded me. I mean, I, I've, I've, I am, uh, I've known uh, Okuma for a number of years now and, and we've stayed in touch on this. And to hear him talk about this was just astounding to me. Um, so I'm not sure that answers it. Um, how has the power of these uh, different civic groups changed over time? Because uh, if you look at like labor union, uh, like um, labor union like membership rates, for instance, like since the 60s, that has like dr drastically gone down. Here in the United States. Uh, in Japan. Actually. In Japan as well. OK. Well, the other thing is that J Japan, Japan's labor unions by the early 1950s had recognized, as had the industries themselves, that if they continued as they were going with labor locking management out of factories in protest, that they were going to destroy each other. And so they reached a compromise. And while the spring offensive continues, I think, to this day, it has much less influence than it did in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, the number of manufacturing jobs in Japan has, has, has declined. A lot of industry has moved offshore. Um, for example, in, in an area south of Niigata, um, people used to produce silverware. That's all done in China now. Same company's doing it, but the labor is no longer in Japan. Uh, and that, that means that the prominence and the, the leverage of labor unions is, is I think, restricted. Yes. Um, so I have a question. Before I ask it, am I correct in assuming that there's a correlation between like infrastructure and geography and government and like, what type of is there a, a correlation in what sense? In that like um, so you talked about dams and how they brought I think I I understood that they brought um, it changed like civil society and it helped the it helped the economy and so kind of Shifting it towards a democracy. What I'm arguing basically is that it's shifting, that it's not supporting democratic oh. uh, relationship. I mean, basically, the the prefectural government shows signs of ignoring the Naganohara Machi citizens. The national government certainly is, and they were. I mean, both of them seem to have been terribly ignorant of basic local conditions the nature of the water, the nature of the economy, what it was that was important for people to be able to continue to, to, to um, exist and continue to live. Um, they showed an incredible degree of, of, of ignorance. Um, and, and certainly the two prominent representatives of this particular district, uh, Fukuda and Nakasone, um, showed no real involvement with the community at all. So the, the superficial appearance is democratic, but the way things are operating is not particularly democratic. Yeah, yeah but, but at the same time, it's, it's impressive how they fight, I think. So yeah. it, it kind of triggered, I mean, it, 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 it unintentionally, right? but it, it, it does kind of at different times bring different groups together at the local level. And, uh, at, the, at, at the local level, but ultimately it's the national level's concerns that take priority. Um, so people were arguing uh, before the construction re was, was started that, look, we've gone f more than half a century without this dam, and Tokyo's doing just fine. The lower Tone River is doing just fine. 
the estimates of demand for water are in fact not being proven by the way things have been developing. And yet, we go right ahead and build this dam. Yes? I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what it's like to research this topic in Japan. Um, you've been able to get access to documents, the Ministry of Construction, or is that something Pure you chance. <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, I, I, I happen to be in, in, in Niigata, where, where Okuma teaches, uh, in the early 1990s, doing research on a completely different project. Um, and during the course of that, I became interested in <coughs> looking at the history of, of technology, because there had been an earthquake in 2005, and when there's earthquakes, People have to give up, give up their houses. If you give up your houses and have to move, that's a discipline. You have to get rid of stuff. Well, one of the things that fell into the hands of the Tokamachi Library was a collection of photographs by a family, uh, done by a family over several generations, going back to the 19th century, uh, photographs of the local area. And among those, you could see images of hand labor, human labor, being used to construct dikes in 1955. Not machines, not modern materials for the most part, but doing the same kind of thing and laying stones that you could have seen in the 17th century. Japan's industrialized, right? It's modernized, right? Why do we have this? And that's what led me into this. And again, I was fortunate enough to have connections. For, for totally different reasons, I had connections with Okuma. I uh, had connections with his, some of his engineering PhD students who were writing historical dissertations. Um, and, and this has just all kind of fallen in my lap. And I, I'm, I'm captivated by it. I'm engaged. I like it. I have fun with it. Um, but it, it's chance in this case. <laughs> just pure serendipity. Yes? Um, so in the United States, there's a growing movement to remove dams mm -hmm. and uh, repair and restore, you know, rivers to their natural state. Is there anything like that in Japan? Absolutely, yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, 2015, uh, I was was in Japan, and there was a um, an environmental festival of sorts at which Kato Tokiko actually came to sing. Um, she's in her 70s at this point, but still still quite active. And, and um, up as part of that, Patagonia was sponsoring showings of damnation, Japanese versions of damnation. There uh, were movements that were successful in getting the decommissioning of some dams, but it's a relatively small number, and, and I don't know that there's, there's a great move in that direction at this, at this point. I think people um, have kind of complicated feelings. If, if you think about the picture of the Miyagase Dam that I showed when I had all the statistical data up there, um, you saw a lot of people around taking pictures. Dam tourism is big business. Engineering in many ways is still valued in Japan. Um, Somebody who wrote a history of dams entitled his book uh, Useful Pyramids. And in a number of ways, that's the way this is still viewed. There's a kind of non-public, non semi-public, semi-private organization called the Japan River Society. And these people talk about the rivers and the dams and the dikes all the time. And they compile useful statistics as well. But, but there's a, not necessarily a negative feeling about these projects among many people in Japan. And these, these issues of dam tourism function alongside similar organizations, people who are fans of trains. You know, they, 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 it's still desirable in Japan to think of having a career in a railway company. How many of you are planning to do that? <laughs> you know, what's happened to our railroads? Um, and, and technology is still in many ways valued. There's, there's, or the, the, this kind of technology is, is, is still valued. There was a program, a popular program that ran on TV for a number of years called Project X. And it was all about 
Japanese engineers and Japanese scientists who had developed some new product or, or um, new way of doing things. Uh, yes? Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. You. No, no. Uh, this concept of damn tourism, uh, that picture you were just talking about, looked like there was some kind of amusement park character in the middle of it. Do you, do you recall? Uh, I yeah. don't remember this. Yeah. Did yeah. anyone I, I, else notice that there was a, like a, a mascot with a big yellow? Unless that's uh, entirely possible. Unless mascots. I am hallucinating. No, yeah. no. At this late time, then. Mascots, mascots are very common in Japan. Uh, every city has them. Every prefecture has them. Every ministry of the, of the government has one. Um, let's see. It's entirely possible. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes. Red shirt, blue. Yes. No. 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 You're absolutely right. I hadn't. I hadn't paid attention to that. But, but this is. This is. This is part of the kind of popularization of, of these things, and making them appealing. Yeah. And you talked about a museum. Yeah. yeah. The museum to the project that's never getting. Yeah. Done. The museum was built before the dam yeah. was. Yes. <laughs> wow. So. Uh, well. Uh, so <laughs> rather than a military industrial complex, you know, this is what I'm seeing. Mm. As you were saying, you know, the U.S. has a military industrial complex that's supposed to be looking out for Japan, uh, but they can have their damn tourism uh, complex or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, these big public works projects um, complex that it's yeah, and, and, and the, the nature of bureaucracy in the Japanese government is very different than it is in the United States. We assume that, that the president and his administration control the bureaucracy. In Japan, people don't make that assumption. In fact, it tends to work in the opposite direction. The people with the expertise are the people in the bureaucracy. So if people in the foreign ministry we were to, to advise you to lay off the Ukraine in some way, uh, you would do it. Um, and and uh, while there's an effort by political parties to be more <coughs> aggressive in, in dealing with the bureaucracy, I think bureaucratic inertia is really important. Because not only do the politicians get funded by industry, but if you get high, reasonable positions within ministries, when you retire, and I think well, for much of the post-war period, re mandatory retirement was 55. So you still have an active life left, okay? Who hires you? The companies you used to regulate. And, and with the longest average lifespan in sure. the world, right? So yes. you retire at 55. Yeah, well, and, 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 and so this, there, 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 there are multiple mechanisms that kind of feed on yeah. each other here. And it's very difficult to find cases of outright corruption. You know, somebody saying, I'll give you X amount of money if you give me this contract or something on that order. That's, that's very, very difficult to, to uh, document. Uh, Brian Woodall, a political scientist at uh, uh, Georgia Tech, um, did a, a monographic study of this, and he just he had a tremendously difficult time being able to identify anything like that. But the idea that, you know, if you take care of us, when you retire, we'll take care of you, is still very powerful. Yes. Yeah. Um, so in your um, talk, you kind of you know, mentioned quite a few times that the Yamba Dam is just, and I might have mispronounced that, but. It's just kind of one of a large number of dams that are being mm -hmm. built in Japan at this time. And you kind of seem to imply, maybe I'm wrong, that the same kind of story of kind of an anti-democratic kind of um, tendency and kind of ignoring local conditions mm -hmm. could have actually happened in a lot of other places as well as the end of the dam. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering, have you looked at kind of other case studies this no, I, I, I haven't. This is actually designed as a chapter of a monograph that basically is taking a look at about 300 years of, of flood control history and technology. Um, and well, the more historical sources, um, I, I know how to ferret those out. <laughs> Um, uh, a lot of what happened in this particular case is, is quite different. But again, uh, by way of chance, I discovered uh, while in Niigata working on a, on a different project, 
uh, a Japanese colonial project in Taiwan that was, has been received very favorably by, even by post-war Taiwanese. And it becomes the, the focus of a special positive relationship that Taiwan has with Japan. And another dam in Manchuria that was started seven years after the completion of the first one, which now has a museum erected to it as well, but just looks at the Japanese project as the epitome of everything vile about the Japanese. So how do you end up with two different kinds of, of, of perspectives? Uh, and I hoped to do a real investigation of the, what was going on in Manchuria, but this is too sensitive a subject to research in China at this point. Um, so, so I've dropped that. I'll do the Taiwan project. But this has taken me in lots of different directions that I didn't anticipate. Uh, but I want to try to keep that whole project in mind rather than get diverted on something else. I, I mean, I was just wondering, I mean, is it fair to say that this could actually be a unique case and that didn't happen in other places? Or is it hard to judging, say? Judging simply by the people who set up booths at the various Take Back the River conferences, there are a number of other examples. Yeah. Your talk has made me really kind of curious about dams. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you a couple of more technical questions. You mentioned that the dam there was a, a, a cement gravity dam. Yeah. So what other? What does that mean? What other kind? Well, of there can be there, there can be there can be earth gravity dams. There can be. Um, uh, earth fill dams, uh, semi hydraulic earth uh, earth filled dams where you water down the, the earth to make it compact. Um, basically, um, in Japan, you're talking almost exclusively about about dams of that sort. Um, I can't describe the technical dimensions of of various dams. I can't even tell you much about dam engineers. Because in most instances, the, the way in which records are kept are in a corporate form. Individual designers are not identified. So this is a really uh, different in environment than what we think of in the United States, where we can identify who designed what particular dam and, and who was involved in the process. Um, there's a lot more in the way of personal records that we have that are left and that's not the case with Japan. So companies publish their own corporate histories, and they include a lot of primary source material that's very useful. But you, you have a difficult time being able to latch on to somebody to interview. Uh, a, a PhD student of ours uh, who's doing work on the ways in which Japanese in the post-war period transformed the image of Japanese products from cheap and unreliable to very advanced and very reliable uh, has been in a somewhat different position because he's been able to interview people who are still alive. But you've got to try to find somebody who's retired or left the job and feels that they don't have to protect the company anymore in order to get interesting material. And that's that's a real challenge. If you interview people who are still employed, uh, or maybe even recently employed, they're likely to be defensive. They're likely to be helpful in some ways, but not fully revealing. Um, so, so doing that that kind of thing is, is that, that kind of research is is much more problematic, I think, than than it would be in the United States. All right. Any last questions? Thank you for some great, Thank you. great questions. It was fun to talk. <laughs>